newer concepts that I'll present, um, go through really quick. You can look at our publications page online for, for some of these. Really fascinating. There's a lot of talk lately, of course, justifiably about dual pole and the benefits to warning operations. The Rho HV depressions with tropical cyclone tornadoes stand out like a flashlight. This is not an anomaly here at Lower Right. This was, this was an event in North Carolina. Joey Pika, you know him, Joey and I did a, uh, a paper for the most recent Severe Storms Conference that covers a bunch of cases of these. So you see it upper left, again, the red's missing in this display, but reflectivity is a huge mess. Uh, velocity gives you some indication that there's a mesocyclone there, but it's some distance from the radar, the resolution is in question. Spectrum width, a useful and underappreciated parameter, uh, uh, actually a base moment in the 88D, uh, can also give you a clue. And the juxtaposition of the spectrum width, of the velocity couplet, with that, a pronounced rho HV min. So why is that rho HV min correlation coefficient, in other words, cross-correlation coefficient, why does it stand out so much? Part of the reason is that in a tropical cyclone scenario like this, you have essentially uniform size distribution and sorting of warm cloud precipitation. You're not dealing with hail. You're not dealing with dust. Not in a tropical cyclone at least not at the lowest cuts, half degree, you don't have to worry about hail. It's deep, it's warm, and the rain particles tend to be well distrib distributed in strong wind fields, shredded, uniform size, and so tornado debris just stands out, a brilliant beacon. So if you want uh, cases of, of rho HV minima in TCs, it's, it's the ideal examination medium. There's a cross section through the same one. You can see the tilt with height um, from, from east to west. In this case, down shear, the shear vector is pointed largely toward the west in this case because that's the motion of, of the, um, the supercell around the TC. So you can see the tilt of the debris plume with height. It's not all that deep. The supercells are not all that deep, just a few kilometers most of the time. Dual or, or phased array radar. Um, promise of future higher resolution examinations uh, of radar. This is an animation that Pam Heinzelman gave me for use in the 2012 paper. It's linked from that paper if you want to look at it in more detail. But this illustrates the difference in spatio-temporal resolution between the legacy 88D, this is pre-sales and mesocells by the way, and the uh, phased array radar. So that promises, if it's ever uh, delivered in your lifetime or mine, that promises a much deeper and better interrogation spatio-temporally of tropical cyclones. Convection-allowing models have some promise, but they also have some caveats. Here's an example from Hurricane Katrina. Uh, the NCAR wharf with an ARW core, four kilometer mesh, those are the specs. So a four kilometer grid spacing, valid at, at, at a particular time that's listed there. It's a 48 hour forecast. So you look at that and go, huh, looks like there may be some supercells in that TC. Wonder uh, how the environment's gonna look. Then we have the NCAR Wharf ARW, same core, with a uh, one and a third kilometer grid spacing. Again, grid spacing and resolution are different things as you've probably been lectured on. That's valid at the same time, same day. So I'll show you the verifying reflectivity. Again, that promises, oh, that, that, that's, that storm is gonna be absolutely infested with supercells. We better outlook tornadoes. That is the verifying reflectivity at about 43 minutes before the uh, model time, model forecast time from the NOAA P3 aircraft. There's not a tornadic supercell to be found. The lesson, precision is not accuracy. And this is the case for mid-latitude convection allowing models too. If you go into forecasting, you will be absolutely tantalized at the precision and, and that, these, these, that these forecast, and you will be tempted to go with them. But they're not always accurate, and especially for situations like this, where you have intense gradients. These mid-latitude cams are not designed for tropical cyclones. They're just not. Use with caution. Use with care. 
Reversible cape, this is going to be the last major topic we'll cover. I won't spend a whole lot of time doing this. I know it's valuable for, uh, for your class. You may or may not, depending on Ariel's whims on the day he develops the test, be tested on this. But please do read the paper. I won't go into a great amount of detail here because we're time limited, but I will show you the difference. The equations are up there. Again, they're also in the paper. The difference between CAPE and reversible CAPE in the, in the ways that we traditionally use them. Pseudoadiabatic CAPE on the left. Essentially what happens physically is that liquid water goes away as soon as you condense. Now that's not physically realistic. But every CAPE calculation you've ever seen throws out liquid water as soon as it condenses in the profile. And so when you adiabatically descend that parcel back down, that's a totally different parcel. It's a different process. So that means it's irreversible. You can't go back and redo it in a sense because you have lost that liquid water in the parcel. Is that realistic for hurricanes? They are absolutely jam-packed with liquid water. If any scenario has liquid water in the descending profile it is a hurricane with four to five inch an hour rain rates in some places. <clears throat> so we decided to look at the reversible cape parcel where it has no loss of liquid water and greater parcel density due to water loading. Again, conceptually, it's a more physically realistic depiction. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of cases to test it on because our sample size is fairly low in terms of proximity soundings. Um, but you can read the paper and, and read more about that. Reversible CAPE is more situationally applicable in TC setting, but the value should be lower than, than most unstable or mixed CAPE, and I'll illustrate that shortly. What it assumes, again, these are not necessarily valid assumptions either, but they're better in the TC. It assumes no evaporation, so it's more physically valid. Unfortunately, neither traditional pseudoadiabatic CAPE or reversible use entrainment. Um, there's no latent heat effusion examined yet. We hope to incorporate that later. And then uh, the data we use, again, is described in the paper, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But those are our proximity sounding criteria. We attacked it from two approaches. Sounding centric can have more than one tornado, or tornado centric that can have more than one sounding attached to a given tornado in its proximity. So you can say the, see the values of reversible CAPE on the left are a lot lower in absolute sense. If we introduce latent heat effusion, we will probably crank those values back up to something more resembling the kind of pseudo-adiabatic CAPE you're used to looking at, but we haven't been able to do that yet. Again, there's the distribution of the different parcels that are used. Uh, you would expect the most unstable reversible CAPE to be bigger than the, than the uh, than the mixed layer parcels, or the, even the surface space, than they are. Preliminary results, this is also given in a paper. I won't belabor these too much as far as the day versus the night, but of course, you can see the distribution is, uh, the differences are not as big as you might think they would be. Um, a lot of it is subtleties in the Kate profiles. This is an extensive one, also given in the paper. Um, the differences between the inner, the middle, and the outer radius. On those polar graphs I showed, basically an inner ring, a middle moat, and then an outer moat around the uh, tropical cyclone center. And of course, in general, you tend to get more buoyancy, uh, whether pseudoadiabatic or reversible in the outer part of the storm, but that's not always the case. All buoyancy indicators are larger for tropical depressions and TSs and hurricanes at tornado time. Mostly because in hurricanes you have a big extensive CDO that's limiting heating, central dense overcast. In decaying systems, more heating, more dry slots, more pockets of areas where uh, warmth can occur diurnally. And there is considerable overlap with CAPE types across the rating distributions. SPC forecast examples I'll go through quickly. There's our moderate risk for Ivan. Um, we outlook these just like we outlook mid-latitude systems, except that we coordinate with the Hurricane Center on the hurricane hotline and also sometimes on chat in terms of where the forecast track is going to be, and that will allow us to place the outlook in the preferentially, uh, climatologically preferred sectors of the storm. When it starts to make landfall, 
the tornado potential increases even before landfall. Here's a case with Ike in 2008. You can see President Ike is on there as well. We issue MCDs for the potential for a watch, and, and a watch was issued in this case as Ike moved inland. It produced some tornadoes. Watches, um, again, tend to issue tornado watches in that preferred sector of the storm, not for the whole storm, and not for every tropical cyclone. Some TCs don't produce very many tornadoes. Sometimes we don't have high tornado probabilities or watches for tropical cyclones. They're coordinated just like the other watches with the WFOs. They're county-based. They're cleared and extended by the local WFOs. We still do the legacy polygons for aviation purposes. And of course, the probabilities, you can go to the web page and see those for any watch. Same as with a TC. Some don't produce tornadoes. You know where to go for our forecasts? There's my email address. I know it went fast by necessity. Please email me. You're more than welcome to email me with questions. Uh, I promise I don't know what AC is going to test you over. So I'll just answer your questions out of complete impartiality and neutrality. He has not told me, and he probably won't tell me what he's going to test you over from this. So anyway, there's your mandatory reading. Uh, you've been given um, that already in your syllabus. I noticed online with his web page. It's available on the publication site as well as ejssm.org. There's a bunch of great papers at EJSSM. I'm a little bit biased because I'm an editor for that journal. But it is a great way to publish uh, papers inexpensively and with extremely high scientific and review standards. There's the reversible CAPE preprint. Again, I apologize I couldn't go into that in more detail because of limited time. But there's the resource. It's there. It's on the publications page. Please read that. Uh, otherwise, you might get tested and, and, and not like the results. The database is there. I'll leave that there, email address. Uh, you're welcome to go in and look at that database. It's in Excel format. I will try to update it as soon as Patrick Marsh uh, gets the 2016 tornado data updated. But I can tell you right now, preliminarily, there are probably not going to be more than about 30 or 40 at most TC tornadoes added from last year. So the, the sample size distribution is not going to be that different. So thank you. Thanks for your patience uh, with everything. And for those who are willing to stick around, I'll stick around and answer questions.